office and from our fiscal research, and we're projecting a hundred million, almost a hundred six million dollar surplus on the budget going into this year. If you think about it, that is a uh, about a three billion dollar swing. Um, when we came in in January of 2011, the surplus was a, a little over 2.6 billion dollars. So, I think it's a good example of how some of the tough decisions we made in 2011 are creating a much better baseline for us to work with in, in 2013. I'm very proud of the, the members of Appropriations and Finance that worked to put that together. Um, this week, if we'll be happy to talk about other bills that may be of interest to you. This week we will be moving the eminent domain bill again. Uh, we passed out of the House last year. We weren't able to get consensus in the uh, Senate, but we're hopeful this year that our colleagues in the Senate will work with us, and that would be a constitutional question that would be on the ballot in November of uh, 2014. And actually, if you have any questions about the bill, Representative McGrady will be uh, sponsoring the bill this year. I'd be happy to have him answer any questions at uh, the end of my comments. Um, that bill is uh, something that's uh, had a history in the House. It, it was passed out of the House with large majorities, actually under Democratic leadership. And uh, I'm not, uh, not sure what they had in mind when it went to the Senate. I think I saw at least one press report saying that maybe that was just a way to appease some folks and not get it through. But make no mistake about it, the House wants eminent domain and protection of property rights put into the Constitution and passed out in, in 2014. We're going to do our best to make that happen. Um, Another bill that we're going to be moving this week that's important is the, the bill that was passed out of the Senate that we read in last night on, on vocational education. It's House Bill 51. We had a companion bill in the House. We had agreed with the Senate to have them move that bill first, but we'll be taking that up, and I expect that'll be one of the first bills the governor signs, and I know that it's a priority of the governor's. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the Medicaid ban bill that's in House Health right now, who we're talking about. Um, do you anticipate that to come to the floor this week? Uh, I'm not sure. Did you refer to it as a Medicaid ban bill? Well, the Medicaid expansion block. Okay. Yes. It's, um, it, if you take a look at the bill, uh, it does two things. One is it, it uh, supports the governor's position that uh, he believes that North Carolina should go the path of the federal exchange. We agree, and we've, that's consistent with comments that we've made in the past. The Medicaid expansion piece is really setting the tone for not expanding Medicaid. It doesn't actually have any specific effect at this time. It, it, it could as national health care is rolled out. But let me tell you why we think it's very important to set the expectation that we're not interested in spending more money in HHS today. Duly elected Democratic auditor has said hundreds of millions of dollars have been wasted are uh, either through, through just outright wasteful practices and policies or through wasteful management. We believe that before we have a discussion about really increasing funding for Medicaid, we need to make sure that the process that we're putting it into is going to make it more likely that those dollars go to people who need help versus just be churned through an inefficient and wasteful uh, department that, that, that's fairly well documented. They have a lot of work to do. I have the utmost confidence in the governor and Secretary Voss to get it right. In the future, we'll take up discussions about Medicaid funding. This sets the tone for today, and it puts the emphasis back on fixing the problem that we have over in the, uh, the Medicaid division at this time. So follow to that, Speaker Tillis, will it be on the floor potentially Thursday then? It may. Or? It may. Uh, it depends on what comes out of the uh, Health and Human Services Committee today. There's language that's come into the proposed committee substitute that is uh, uh, a part of that was uh, in cooperation with the governor. We put language in that they feel like better enables them to manage the situation, and that's very important. What we're trying to do right now is give the governor all of the tools and flexibility he needs to get Health and Human Services on the right track. And the language still gets to what the Senate wanted to do. There's no material difference in the outcome. What it does do is provide the governor and the secretary more flexibility to manage through that very difficult situation, which is why the House supports it. And, and I, I would expect that the Senate will, too. We're hopeful that they will be. There's a regulatory reform bill uh, in committee tomorrow, I believe. What are your thoughts on what's going to happen with that? Uh, it's my understanding that that bill is more the framework that we're going to be using to go through the regulatory reform process. 
And that's a very important thing for uh, the, the citizens to understand and stakeholders to understand. What we're really trying to do is find a way to identify regulations that we believe may be in excess of what North Carolina needs in a given category. But instead of just outright appealing them this year, they'll be identified for a sunset that would be sometime probably in June of 2014. And now what we're going to do is set forth the process that those who are regulated, the regulators who may support the bill, and those who are regulated to come before the General Assembly and build their case. And then, if necessary, early in the session, in the interim, we can identify any regulations that perhaps we should remove the sunset on and, and do that over a 12-month period. So I think it's a very thoughtful, methodical process, and that's the primary intent of the bill this week. Quick follow-up. Um, the bill as it's written in the House and the Senate makes it look like uh, this would go for all regulations of certain types, not just you know ones that are identified. Is that just the way it's written now? Is it going to change? or? Well, I, th I think the goal is to look at, when I think of regulations, I think of any rules, regulations, statutes that have been implemented by the government, by, by the state of North Carolina, that may be inconsistent with best practices or norms in other states, particularly in the southeast. So the, the whole idea, it's really a part of our challenge is going to be how do you, how do you go after the regulations that are causing the most problems for no real gain? And that prioritization process is something, I'm sure it's going to be iterative, it's going to take some time, but it's something that really hasn't been done in this state in its history, not at this scale. It's also why I think it's one of the most important things we can do for the business environment in North Carolina. Down the road a bit, this, this issue may come up, but a press release from the Senate caught my attention. Uh, Senator Brock, a few of them want to go ahead and move on fracking. Five months after the report comes in, I know you said, let's soak in the research. Five months after they're going to start allowing licenses, is that you're making a mo are they making a mockery of this whole thing? Well, I um, I will uh, withhold judgment on the bill. I'll tell you I probably don't have much much more information than you, but let me let me tell you the the current house position. We worked a lot across the aisle. Remember, we overrode a veto. We had uh, Democratic members join with us, and I believe that one of the key reasons that those members joined with us is because they liked the process that we came up with to make sure that property rights issues are addressed, that environmental issues that are addressed, transportation issues, being ready when we do this, do we really have the right kind of transportation plan in place to make sure that we don't cause some temporary gridlock before the infrastructure is ready to deal with the, uh, with the business that may be created as a result of fracking. So if I felt like there was a, a, a burning platform, if I, if I felt like we needed to compress the time that we've anticipated to get the regulatory uh, reform accelerated, or not regulatory reform, but the, the legislation, regulations for fracking, then I'd be open to it, but I'm not aware of anything. It's, it's more a matter of, uh, I thought it was a very thoughtful process last year, I'd like for it to play out, and, and incidentally, I think it'll play out in a time frame that'll be consistent with when businesses are going to be prepared to come into the state anyway. Uh, Speaker Tillis, on, uh, on the unemployment bill that's passed the House and is now in the Senate, were there any concerns raised in, in the Republican caucus about voting for a bill that would actually raise taxes and, uh, you know, as it relates to uh, a uh, pledge that some of the members had signed not to raise taxes? <clears throat> there was, uh, and that's why we asked them to go back to groups that asked them to sign the pledge and asked them whether or not it was a violation in the, pr in the pledge and to, a, uh, to every organization indicated that it wasn't. And the reason for that is that, you know, it's that now we're, 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 uh, we're talking about a, if you want to call it a tax or a premium on, uh, to, to collect the benefits, the, the, the chamber, the state chamber, the local chambers of commerce, the Nat National Federation of Independent Businesses all said they want it. Americans for Tax Reform, Grover Norquist Organization, uh, Americans for Prosperity said that it was good policy and not inconsistent with the tax pledge. So I think that's, you, you may have seen one, uh, one member in particular who voted on that basis and I respect his opinion. Uh, but I think those who are watching us around tax policy are thinking beyond that. And I'll tell you one reason why that's very important. Because there may be some, when we get into tax reform, and we decide to impose a tax on some category, um, you could view that as a tax increase and in violating the pledge. I've personally met with Grover Norquist, and I've, and I've spoken 
with uh, folks from uh, Americans for Prosperity and others, and they don't view that as a tax increase if you maintain or reduce the overall tax burden on uh, North Carolinians. That's the only way you get out of this cycle, and, and I don't think that we should let politics drive good policy around taxation. I want to go back to the Medicaid expansion issue. Uh, there are some states, Republican governors, out west or Michigan that are embracing the expansion, but there's many in the south that aren't. Do you, do you see this as, is North Carolina's uh, moving ahead in this direction part of a, of a larger plan to try to put pressure upon Washington to give the states more flexibility in running Medicaid in exchange for, the, for expanding? I, I think it may be, and, and I think it's, it's simply this. If the federal government felt like, and, and the Congress, passed a plan that they felt like they could implement through the federal resources, all we're asking them to do is do that. Uh, what we do not want to do is confuse the complexity and the challenges of national health care by just having some of that delegated down to the state and then causing future problems for us. So um, I've asked my staff, I, I haven't looked, but I suspect that you're talking about uh, states where governors have done this, where there may be a slightly different political mix in their general assemblies and, and really within their voting demographic. And, and I respect their decision to move forward with it. We do not believe it's the best decision for North Carolina. Last year, the House, though, kind of rushed, pushed with, through with some urgency uh, 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 a bill that set up the exchange here. It seems a little incongruous with what you're saying. Well, actually, uh, if, uh, in my terms, it wasn't rushed because it was probably a four to six week process. So that's, that's a dog year where I come from, um, and uh, our legislative year. Um, the, the facts have changed. Um, uh, I've, uh, we, at the time that we were making that decision, we were working with the healthcare community, we were working with the insurance community and the business community. And, and really, it was, it was more around how can we defend against a large, complex, costly federal alternative. Um, so we thought maybe this, this lets us control our own destiny, but a year and a half has passed. We know a lot more about uh, the, the national health care plan, and I'm convinced now that it could be bait that we could have taken that would have made it more difficult for us, every bit as costly, and maybe even more costly. So in that case, I, I applaud the, the Senate. Uh, we had, there was no uh, pressure between the House and the Senate to move the bill. We'd been advised on it. We were moving forward. They presented some good facts, which is why we didn't make it an issue that the Senate didn't take it up. I think they made a good decision. <coughs> this is a trust thing. The governor says I can't count on them. Apodaca said I don't believe them. Or is, that, is that what we're getting back to? You don't, just don't trust Congress and the President? Um, well, I, I think that there's a consistency issue in Washington. You could call it trust if you choose to. Mine is just consistency and certainty, and there is very little consistency and certainty coming out of Washington, so we have to do everything we can, t can do to, to mitigate risk in North Carolina. Boards and commissions, the bill that came over from this Senate Senate Bill 10. Yes. Where, what's this likely to pass? Well, there, there are really two fundamental pieces to that bill, Laura. There's the, uh, the special judges and the judicial consideration, and then there's the boards and commissions. Let's, let's take them separately. Uh, I actually think that there's merit behind looking at the, the special superior court judges and rethinking whether or not we need as many uh, as we have today or, or, or maybe repurpose them. As you know, the Constitution sets forth uh, powers for the General Assembly to determine from time to time to expand or contract special judges. So that's a very different treatment than, say, Supreme Court judges or other, other offices. Um, the data that we have today, though, suggests that special judges are only on the bench less than eight hours a week. These are $100,000, $140,000 a year jobs, I think. We have DAs crying for more court time. And I do know that a judge has to be off the bench and in his or her chamber to prepare, but I'm wondering if it's a four to one ratio. So there's a legitimate question to be asked about do we need this many or do we need productivity out of fewer? Uh, then the other question is if you have fewer uh, special judges, can you free that money up for other uses in the courts that may be a better and higher use? On the boards and commissions, so that's the, the, the judicial piece, and it's very possible that we'll, we'll deal with that separately, but I would expect we will, we will take that up and be largely consistent with what the Senate's proposed. On the boards and commissions, boards and commissions are creatures of the legislature. They exist to govern areas of the state 
and to ensure that the letter of the law is followed, but as importantly, the spirit of the law. And I think that my colleagues in the Senate have made a very good point. We have a legacy of appointees there and others who may or may not, they may follow the letter of the law, but whether or not they follow the spirit may have to do with their, uh, their background and their preferences that may or may not be consistent with the legislature. So I think this is a natural process of transformation when you've seen the kind of transformation that we've had in the state, uh, the first of its kind. So uh, I think that that's just a natural part of governing. It's a natural part of a administration transition as well. We'll be working with the governor to make sure that we have something that he's also comfortable with as well. What data shows that judges, these special judges are only working eight hours a week? We've, um, I had my, uh, my staff reach out to, I'm not sure which agency, to, to, to ask the simple question, because I guess they log time when they're on the bench, uh, and we'd be happy to share that with you. I think it's public information. I think that uh, the, uh, the number was somewhere between eight and nine hours uh, for a, a typical superior court judge, and seven or so hours for a special judge. Um, so I've asked the natural question. I don't, I don't think a judge can be on the bench 40 or 50 hours a week because if they are, they're probably working 100 or so hours a week to prepare for it. So we're trying to figure out what the right ratios are. But, um, and there's also a very big difference, I think, between the duties of a sitting Superior Court judge and a special judge, and we're just trying to work through that. But we'd be happy to share that information with you. We'll get it to you today. One more thing. I, I keep hearing around the, the building. 2% cuts, all agencies have been requested to submit budgets 2% lower. I guess the governor's office is doing that right now. You say we've got a slight surplus. What's the fiscal policy for 2013? Well, I, I think that uh, you're going to see some areas that will probably be cut because in our opinion, and our assessment, they're, uh, they're not as efficient as they should be. North Carolina is not running, the government is not running at 100% efficiency. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would argue that this state is running at 100% efficiency. But let's assume half of it is. Let's say this $20 billion budget, $10 billion of it is as good as it gets. I'm not sure if that's a valid assumption, but let's just use it for argument's sake. Then of that other $10 billion, we're looking for ways to reduce or eliminate inefficiencies. And the only way you do that is to challenge the folks out in government to look at how they can do more with less. And hopefully that will stimulate the identification of things that they can do more productively, more efficiently. But at the end of the day, unlike two years ago, when we had no choice but to go around and say on average we had to cut 12%, we're in a position to where we can also use money to more productive purposes. And that's, what we're, that's a process we're going through. I would expect any budget. If we had a billion dollar surplus, I would expect my appropriations chairs to go back and say, how can you do more with less? And then we can look at things like repairs and renovations, uh, replenishing the rainy day fund, and some long-term things that we'd like to do for the state. So if an agency gets cut in a time of a surplus, what is that saying to that agency, in your opinion? Or should what it say to that, I, I've, uh, I've, uh, my press guy is probably going to hate me for saying this, but uh, what I've tried to tell every agency in this state that I've met with, we're going to play a game of finders keepers. If these agencies come forward with recommendations to run more efficiently, we're going to find a way to let them keep those efficiencies and put them into strategic projects, repairs and renovations, whatever they want to. However, if we have to work to find the efficiencies, they are probably not going to keep those cuts. We're asking them to think differently. We're asking them to think about productivity. But we're also going to find a way to reward them. The problem in the past is when a good idea for productivity would come down, they say, oh, I want to do it, but if I do, they're going to cut my funding. And it's created bad behaviors. So we're going to give them an opportunity to find these efficiencies, but make no mistake about it. If we are the ones who ultimately have to find it, then we can no longer trust that leader to find these things in his or her agency. Therefore, we will probably claw back funding until we can establish that trust. So I would challenge everybody at every level, whether you're a rank and file, uh, a state employee, a mid-level manager, or executive director, get within your organization, find efficiencies, and know that as far as the House is concerned, you'll be rewarded for doing that. And if you don't, you'll be giving me some money to spend somewhere else. <laughs>